just like one more grace minute because I see that some people are just coming on um, and then I will start this thing officially. I was warned last week I did not give my tech support adequate notice and so he missed the first few words of my intro so this time I will give better notice. Um, yeah. Um, any other tech questions from anybody? I hear a bird. Oh. Melissa, I guess I, had, I just had a question about um, if we're not reading today, but we're just the audience, do mm -hmm. we just, um, I don't know, is there a special thing? Like, no one needs to see me. I mean, I'm, I'm not, but what, I don't know how people are, what, what are people doing? Are they, oh. are only the visible people, the people who are performing today? No, no, we, we love it if we can see you, because then it feels much more like we're actually with you and reading <laughs> to you. Um, but we do have to keep everybody muted, except yeah. for the person who's speaking, because otherwise right. what happens is things feed back through your computer into the person who's recording, and it gets messy and yeah. bits of it drop out. So, um, let's so, see, it says 68 participants, but I only see like half a dozen. Well, if you, if you have the Brady Bunch view and you go to the middle right of it, you can scroll over and see other screens of, um, do you see that? Oh, like if I, uh, if I hit gal, oh, if I hit gallery, there's everybody. Yeah, you hit gallery view and then click on the little arrow to the right or to the left that you'll find if you cover your mouse over oh, okay. the- Oh, okay. Because I've only done really small Zoom meetings like for writing group and stuff. So, okay, wow, well, there's everybody. <laughs> okay. yes. uh, Melissa, we, we need yeah. to see people <clears throat> falling off their chairs laughing too. Hi, so. Leslie. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Yes, yes, all of you. Um, a couple people last week expressed the desire that you and the audience should be as emotive as possible. If you enjoy a poem, laugh uproariously to the point where we can see you shaking like, you know, Santa Claus. Um, and yes, if you fall off your chair, that's excellent, but please get back on it so that we can then see your face again. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's much nicer to see everybody's faces. Um, Oh, I just saw my dad and Suzanne. Hello, hello. This is great. Um, so many people. Um, so I think we are going to get started. Um, let me make sure that my tech support is getting this message so that when I start introducing people, he hears me. Okay. This is your notice to start recording. Can you give me a sign that you are hearing this, O oh, tech support husband? He's okay. I've got the thumbs up. Okay. All right, well, I am delighted to welcome you all to our third week of Light Verse in Dark Times. We have a spectacular day ahead, I think. Um, I hope you're all having a lovely Mothers in Masks Day. Um, and uh, before we start with today's lineup, I wanna just give you a heads up about next week. Our readers for Sunday, May 17th will be Gail White, J.D. Smith, Chris O'Carroll, Claudia Gary, Daniel Gala, and Barbara Crooker. So that's another super lineup. Don't miss it. It will be at 3 p.m. Eastern time next week. That is our normal time. It's different today, this one time, um, because we have A.E. Stallings with us from Greece. And as you know, it's late there. Hello again. Um, so it is my delight to begin introducing our readers for today. Um, and we are going to begin with Barbara Lidecker Crane. And Barbara, you can go ahead and unmute yourself so you'll be ready when, when you start your reading. Barbara, a finalist for the 2017 and the 2019 Rattle Poetry Prize, has won awards from the Maria Faust Sonnet Contest the Helen Schneibel, or is it Schneibel, Sonnet Contest, and others. She has published three chapbooks, Zero Gravitas, Alphabetrix, and Backwards Logic, all available on Amazon. Her poems have appeared in dozens of poetry journals in this country and in Britain, and in several anthologies. She's also an artist. In this time of quarantine, what she misses most is traveling, that and watching the Red Sox. Barbara, take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. And thank you to the, the people I know, especially who tuned in to watch me and, and all of you. It is quite a treat to see all your faces as I sc scroll through. 
The first poem I'm going to read is very short, and it might be reflective of how you're feeling these days. On an off day. If you feel beside yourself, be careful what you do. Watch your language, watch your step, and hold the door for you. <laughs> the next one um, is a sonnet that I wrote a few years ago, but it is kind of oddly prescient of this particular time. Maybe it was funnier then. Maybe it won't be so funny now. But here it is, it's called Just In Case. Just In Case is a very cautious man. He keeps a cache of bottled water, food, and a pair of spares in the trunk of his sedan. Others think that he's aloof or rude when he inspects each fork and spoon for germs. His sisters know he swivels out of kisses. He navigates the office on his terms. Justin shuns each outstretched hand and misses clinching business deals. He cannot fathom why colleagues eye him strangely when he hits an elevator button by lifting past them his wing-tipped toe. With snake bite kit and mosquito netting, he's ready to embark upon his lunchtime stroll of Central Park. The next one I'm gonna show you first, briefly. It's in the shape of a thumb, for good reason. It's called the left thumb at the keyboard. So as I read it, you might imagine all your digits at the keyboard, especially this guy. The left thumb at the keyboard. The left thumb is a party of one, as if in a lonely single room. The gaggle of four in the flat next door jabber and huddle, snug in their mitten of groupthink. This thumb is never in sync with those digits who clack on keyboards like barnyard hens. Those mental midgets earn good feed while the left thumb's peckish and plenty annoyed at whoever decreed him unemployed in any key position. Brooding on his disjointed condition, he thinks he'll thumb to someplace new and try his hand at texting as his next ambition. Give the hard-bitten guy a lift. Don't be one to point a finger at this idle, opposable thumb. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you. The next two, I <laughs> see these little signs. The next two are from my first book, um, Zero Gravitas. And they both come with apologies to Emily Dickinson. You'll recognize the first one because of her poem, Hope is the Thing with Feathers that Perches in the Soul, and sings the song without the words and never stops at all that we all know. But my poem is called, Soap is the Thing That Lathers. Soap is the thing that lathers, the dial I exalt, a bobbing bird of ivory that never sinks at all. Caress to my extremities, reviving zest so warm, Irish spring from grimy mine, a life boy after storm. I seek to hold this little dove that skirts my bathtub sea, but always when it slips and slides, it will coast on back to me. <laughs> <laughs> and with further apologies to Emily Dickinson, this one, no, I was the slightest in the house. I was a bed bug in that house. I dwelt in Emily's eider. Heaven could not rise to this, my bliss to sleep beside her. So stationed, I could sip her tears. Such piquant wine would fall. And oh, her flesh, it was exquisite. 
For me, sweet E was all. I never moved from that address, nor she. How well we matched. All day I'd listen to her pen and fingers as they scratched. <laughs> I've wondered much about her ways, such quirkiness I sense. But who am I to cast a slur on mighty providence? And I did spell mighty, M-I-T-E hyphen Y. You know, I, I had to. Okay, the last poem is also a sonnet. And I got the idea while watching a baseball game on TV and seeing a billboard at the stadium saying sonnet insurance. And I thought, whoa, I'm gonna write them a letter. <laughs> so I did. This one was published in Light a little while back. Sonnet insurance. And this, as I say, it's my last poem. Dear sonnet staff, I'm eager for your plan. I'll want an underwriter, old school based, Petrarchan or P. Larkin in his taste. He'll speak my terms. I'll benefit from your man adjusting rhymes, making meter strict, assuming the risk of an errant anapest. Or does your firm ensure I'll stand time's test, pull strings to have my every effort picked by a premier publication? One quick draft in the condition of a pre-existing sonnet and the English speaking world would dote upon it? But I admit my first attempts aren't craft. If instant fame's your game, please shelve this letter. Ensure me later when I write it better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Baymar. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Forgot mute all means mute all. Our next reader is Aurel Proto Popescu. She's the author of nine prize winning books and poems for children and adults. She has worked as a storyteller, a writer slash producer of films, and an educator, conducting poetry and fiction writing workshops for students and teachers. Her poetry has been published in reviews and anthologies, most recently in Oberon, The Newverse News, Light, The Spectator, and Spider, the magazine for children. Some of her parodic poetry has been set to music and recorded. She won the Oberon Poetry Prize in 2010 and a commendation in the Second Light Live competition, UK, in 2010, and a commendation, and sorry, on Second Light Live Competition UK in 2016. Her book of translations with Sia Liu, A Thousand Peaks, Poems from China, was honored by the New York Public Library. She's completing work on a forthcoming biography of the ballerina Tanaki Leclerc, and her, her um, website is Aurel Proto Popescu, that's P R O T O P O P E S C U dot com. Morel, please take it away. Thank you, Melissa. And I hate to start by correcting you. I wish it were nine books. It's only seven, but with the ballet biography, it'll be eight. So let's hope that'll be next year. If nowadays we, we don't know what's happening. So supposedly next year. Um, thank you to Melissa and Kevin for giving us all this wonderful opportunity. It's wonderful to attach Na names and faces to all the poems. And um, I also wanted to thank Toby Speed, who introduced me to light poetry not that long ago. I'm sort of a newcomer. I didn't know about it until she told me. And she's also from Long Island, like I am, and uh, doesn't live here anymore, but she writes for children and adults as well. And I'm grateful to her um, for telling, opening up this window for me, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. 
Um, right now, she's Zooming with her grandchildren and children, so she says greetings to everybody who remembers her, Toby Speed. Um, I wrote this first light verse um, with a picture book in mind. Uh, my agent didn't see it that way, and neither did a few editors who looked at it. So it turned up, uh, it was published in Lighten Up Online, March 2017, um, as a shorter poem. It's called Baby Bungee. Bouncy, bouncy, baby bungee, born to bounce, so soft and spongy, stretched his neck, fell off a wall, and sprang back like a rubber ball. Inside his crib, he took a step. His first step packed a load of pep. He hit the ceiling, kicked the light, and bounced around his room all night. Mom took him to a famous store. He wrecked the robot dinosaur. He knocked down blocks, he stopped the clocks. The quake he made caused aftershocks. By three, he was a dribbling star, and people came from near and far to see him barely two feet tall, leap to the rim and dump the ball. His parents hugged him close, their joy as boundless as their bouncy boy. Uh, where am I? He said his first words, ready, set, then shot himself right through the net. Each night he likes to stretch his hands. They spring right back like rubber bands. He pulls his nose, he pulls his head, and snaps himself right into bed. Yet when at rest, his breaths are mild. He sleeps like any tired child. Just moonlight bounces off his walls while dreams spring up as darkness falls. Thank you. Um, the next one I wrote after I went to a concert and I viewed an orchestra playing a Bruckner symphony from the balcony at Carnegie Hall. And I was fascinated by the cymbal player. Now, Bob Schechter, who many of you know and have seen in light, um, he's another Long Island poet for children and adults. He is a great punster, as you know, and he told me that this poem is full of symbolism. And it appeared in light last year, and it's called The Silence of the Symbols. The young conductor poked and stirred the air with his baton all strings and woodwinds working hard, attuned to his commands. I couldn't help but wonder, as the orchestra played on, about that useless fellow with the cymbals in his hands. At least 10,000 notes were played before he made a sound, which made me ponder whether he'd be paid the union rate, just like his colleagues, visibly perspiring pound for pound, some four or five percent of their collective body weight. But then I thought, what sphinx like calm? He waits, and that is hard. No twitches must defile his face. He cannot scratch his nose. He cannot drink, go off to pee, snap fingers, drop his guard. Though what goes on inside his clothes, of course, nobody knows. Are not his shoes as polished as a hundred other pairs? He cannot rest from counting rests. He cannot lose his place. He goes to all rehearsals, sitting still on hardback chairs, and should he miss his moment, he would face profound disgrace. Let others play a million notes before a piece is done. Let lesser beings warble, spend an hour sawing wood. He bides his time, exhausting work, until he makes just one resounding crash. But what a crash! This symbolist made good. His symbols kiss dramatically, and not too soon or late, to make a savage impact on the climax of the score. The symbolist was virile, and he earned his hourly rate. So well, I hope this master of the crash would play once more. Alas, that was the sole display of his vast expertise, unless you count the way his arms then slowly opened wide, right after that decisive crash had stirred a pulsing breeze that resonated all throughout the hall before it died. Thank you. And since my poems, oh, thank you. Since, my, I can't hear you, so. Since my poems are, um, 
on the long side, I thought I would just read three for now. If you have room later and you want more, I have a few more, but I'll just read this last one. Um, this one is called Multiverses, and it's a title with multiple meanings, as you'll see. Um, my husband is a particle physicist, and I wrote this after he explained to me that this universe might not be the only one, and theorists posit multiple universes, which I'm sure is not news to this group. Um, and I knew vaguely about this, but after talking in detail with him, I wrote the poem. And I, I'm mentioning now that this um, being sequestered at home together, quarantined in a way, um, we finally have started work on a project together that I first proposed we do eight years ago, and I'm now regretting uh, proposing. Um, I had an idea that we could do a book for teenagers explaining more or less what he understands about the universe from the Big Bang to the birth of men. So basically he's writing it, I'm sort of translating it into language I can understand, and then I read it to my adult writing group, they don't understand it, and then I retranslate. So that's pretty much what we're going through right now. My initial idea, idea was to do the whole thing in poetry, a kind of um, science Bible in a funny way called Genesis, but it's, it's so detailed I, I, can't, I can't go there. It's not, it's not gonna be poetry. Anyway, this I hope is, and this is a light verse called Multiverses. Don't mix with physicists. I was mistaken to think that I'd be stirred, but I was shaken. They need no laws beyond the elemental to prove the world we love is accidental, that from a bang erupted time and space prerequisites to make our human race. Not happy with five senses, three dimensions, some theorists like to posit vast extensions beyond this cosmological debris. Our universe, a bubble in a sea of short-lived multiverses, if you will, all popping in and out of space until they violate our human intuition and leave us in a maddening condition. Right now, our bubble seems to be expanding, but that can't keep it from one day disbanding. For if some other bubble got ambitious, Forget our stars, no matter how auspicious. Another bang would mean the end of this experiment with one brief fatal kiss. The math holds up, and yet the mind rebels against chaotic cauldrons, bubbling hells that even if they're only hypothetical, and all these multiverses theoretical, still leave us in a listing ship, existence, doomed to go boom with no hope of assistance. In this, the only universe we know, most of the matter doesn't even show. Dark matter and dark energy prevail. The densest ending to a senseless tale, I tell in multiverses, reassuring you anxious souls so far we are enduring. But what is left to do if worlds collide? Here's my advice to you, just stay inside which we're all doing at the moment. And I forgot to mention something. When you mentioned that I had won the Oberon Award in 2010, Oberon Poetry gives $1,000 for a single poem and there's one winner and then there are honorable mentions. And I have one also honorable mention, but I wanted to mention that Rina Espaillat was one of the first winners of the Oberon Prize, I believe in 2003, but she may correct me for a wonderful poem. So anyway, thank you everybody. I guess people are unmuted. Oh, people are now muted again. Sorry. <laughs> um, unless if, if there's anything pressing that anyone needs to say, um, please um, send me a chat or something and, and we'll make sure that you get to say it. Um, uh, well, it's a little weird um, that, that Aurel, that was a, a fantastic reading, a tough act to follow. Um, and it's a little weird now to be introducing myself, um, but that's what I have to do. So here we go. Um, as most of you know, I'm the editor of Light, where I am honored to head up an amazing staff of volunteers and published what the people I believe are some of the funniest poets alive. Um, I've published my own poems and prose in places including the Hopkins Review, Lighten Up Online, Literary Matters, McSweeney's, Mezzo Camine. I'm naming my friends journals because I love them. Um, the New Verse News, 
The New Yorker, The New York Times, so many places that start with new, um, rattle, and the Washington Post style invitational, the weekly humor feature that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and in my collection, Walking In On People, winner of the Able Muse Book Award. Um, I teach at the University of Rochester and live nearby with my husband and at the moment, thanks to the pandemic, both of my wonderful children. My website is melissabelmain.com. Um, I'm going to read you five short poems from a publication that um, you all should know about, The American Bystander. It's a humor, humor magazine um, and they recently started an offshoot called The Quarantine Cavalcade which, um, as you might guess from the sound of it, specializes in pandemic-themed poetry and cartoons and prose. Um, so I hope you'll all check that out. You'll find it at um, theamericanbystander.substack.com. And my first poem is called Contingency Plan. If I come down with it and don't recover, I hope you'll find yourself another lover. Somebody smart and kind and never rowdy, whose inner weather isn't ever cloudy, who cooks as if she sprang from Julia Child and sings so sweetly thrushes are beguiled, who doesn't make you fix the lamps and plumbing or clean for guests you'd rather weren't coming, who finds your point of view completely valid, Ray eating Oreos instead of salad, who reads the same archaic tomes that you do and likes to pair them with erotic voodoo. In other words, your dream girl to the letter, except she looks just like an Irish setter. Thank you. I love seeing all the silent hands. Um, this next poem has, does not reflect at all on how I feel about being with all of you here today. Quarren routine. Skype with dad and tweet with mom. What's up with pals from Greece to Guam? FaceTime your aunt and second cousin. Zoom with neighbors by the dozen. Google Hangout, Facebook too, with classmates whom you barely knew in grade school, high school, college. After, share Snapchat pics and Viber laughter with friends of friends and some guy, Sam, who follows you on Instagram. And daydream of a long vacation from all this social isolation. Coronostalgia. The dream where I'm taking a midterm for a class that I realize with fright I can't name or recall having been to at all, I'd be tickled to dream it tonight. The one where I'm topless in public or more often than not naked assed and encounter my boss, what a terrible loss that this dream is a thing of the past. Hey, even the one where I'm driving, though I'm half in the rear middle seat and I notice, say what, that my eyes are glued shut, has become an impossible treat. Instead, I keep having a nightmare. My poor nerves can no longer withstand, one that loops without end. I say hi to a friend who runs up and starts shaking my hand. Um, this next one was inspired by um, that unsung muse, Living Social, purveyor of coupons for things that you might do in your city. I got something in my email um, uh, advertising psychic readings by phone. So this is your socially distanced fortune and what your psychic is thinking, parenthetically. Trust me, friend, my powers are so great that even through the phone, I see your fate. You're sure to meet a stranger, Tiger King. Do lots of travel round the block all spring. See friends online for not so happy hour. Shop till you drop for baker's yeast and flour. Gain awesome skills at reading charts of doom. Make bold career moves, pants-free chats on Zoom. Taste new cuisines, miss scent by Instacart. Get a fresh look, botched bangs, disastrous part. Receive a windfall 
federal and tiny, and innovate, Ray, how to wipe your hiney. Yes, yes, I've glimpsed it all through mystic fog while I've done laundry and dewormed my dog. And this last poem is called Sidewalk Face Off. It's inspired by scenes in my neighborhood and I imagine many of your neighborhoods are similar. Sidewalk Face Off. Look from opposite directions, wearing masks to thwart infections, two athletic pairs of spouses march past neo-Tudor houses, sneakers pound and pulses quicken. It's a game of COVID chicken. Who will keep on striding forward, chin and eyeballs firmly lowered? Who will scurry six feet over to the dog do studded clover, fearful that they'll later sicken thanks to playing COVID chicken? Every day the teams assemble, every day their innards tremble like the innards of scared rabbits, but they keep their walking habits. In a world that's stalled and stricken, there's no sport but COVID chicken. Thank you. Very funny. Thank you. Okay, everybody has now been rudely remuted. Sorry, I hate doing that. Um, our next reader is Amit Majmadar. Amit uh, has been publishing with Light since the autumn 2006 issue when he became Light's youngest featured poet and was introduced but to readers by a generous essay penned by one of today's other readers, A.E. Stallings. His newest book is forthcoming in August 2020 and is entitled What He Did in Solitary. His website is www.amit, that's A M I T, Majmadar, M A J M U D A R.com. And Amit, um, please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, uh, for, for, for everything, for putting this together, but also for taking over the reins at light. Um, after John Mella, because John Mella was very important to me early on. He was one of the first editors who ever got behind my work, and he was so nice to correspond with, and it really meant a lot to me back in 2005, 2006, when I hadn't really been published anywhere, when John Mella came back to me and was like, I want to feature you in this, and you know, do you know anyone who could write an essay about you? I was like, I know nobody. I have no connections whatsoever, but I knew that I, I absolutely adored this uh, poet named A.E. Stallings, and so I emailed her out of the blue, and I'd emailed her earlier also about just, just one of her many wonderful poems, and uh, it, was, it was, I think, a triolet or something like that, and she said, oh, you know, I, I always thought it was very slight, um, and so I was surprised that it was published at all, and so one of the poems that was in that first time I ever appeared in light in that feature, that set of featured poems, was actually a poem that I wrote to A.E. Stallings um, before that ever happened. And that was called um, To A.E.S. Who Feared Her Poems Were Slight. So this is for uh, Alicia Stallings like all these years later. Um, <clears throat> Slight, like those ballerinas in Degas who drape their forms along their ribboned calves or wait on tiptoe out of weightlessness. Slight, like those eggs by Fabergé that hatch a hundred even slighter eggs until they bear a heart more intricate than time. Though if one hatched a bird, the bird would be slight in its bones, a hummingbird whose wings had rhythms privy both to stillness and flight. Let no one slight your slightness. Yeats once dreamt a songbird engineered in beaten gold that tilted its head and hopped on its bow and sang a holy emperor to tears. Uh, so that's a, that's a somewhat um, not, not so jokey poem, but uh, one thing I noticed that Light has done is, you know, they, they'll often publish poems that are, um, you know, not necessarily silly, but they, they can also have like a, they can be light in their form, 
and yet have a deeper meaning. And I really love that about both John and Melissa in their editorial choices. So the one that I just had, you know, there's something old, something new. Well, the one that, I, that was just in the most recent edition of Light was, it's called Maximalism. And it's this really short poem that goes like, uh, uh, the art of the large has to filch its appeal from the littlest blueberries dotting the field. A smudge on the thumbs is the closest it comes to the feel of the real. And uh, in these times of uh, COVID fear and mortality, um, I want to share another one that was published back in 2006. And it's called Gravedigger's Triolets. And um, each one of these three triolets uh, begins with a line from, from Hamlet. And it, so the first one is, let her paint an inch thick, to this favor she must come. She dabs on today's face, she claps the compact shut. Revlon rivers, mascara, however careful, runs. Let her paint an inch thick, to this favor she must come. Old age stalks her with a penknife, and he means to cut to take down the gorgeous forgery and slash it some. Let her paint an inch thick. To this favor, she must come. She dabs on her death mask. She claps the compact shut. The second one is, where be your jibes now, your gambles, your songs? Radios rasp at your touch, all your CDs skip. Your voice hasn't cracked like this since junior prom. Where be your jibes now, your gambles, your songs? Your comeback stuck between your stuttering lips. Your best foot forward trips. Something is wrong. Where be your jibes now, your gambles, your songs? Radios rasp at your touch. All your CDs skip. The third trio, that is. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. Now all it does is whistle at the girls. I don't know how it manages without lungs. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. Sometimes you heard a wheeze, sometimes a gurgle, but I vouch it Sinatra could fool anyone. That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. Now all it does is whistle at the girls. This is the first poem I ever, um, ever published, ever, ever wrote. I, I shouldn't say ever wrote. I mean, obviously you try little things, but like the first, the earliest poem that I ever um, wrote and then got published later on is this one that I'm about to read to you. It's called Picnic. And I wrote it when I was 16 years old and I was sitting on, on, the, on a lawn with my, one of my friends and we were just talking about something and he was like, he would like pick at the grass and just kind of like shred it. And uh, I just thought about how like emblematic at the time, how emblematic that was of like human existence. So I was like, so there's, so I wrote this Dickinsonian quatrain on it and it's called Picnic. This also appeared in life. There's much that's casual in death. How passingly we pass as if God chatting on a lawn, or picking at the grass. Um, and uh, I'm going to read you two, uh, two more poems, both of which appeared in light over the years. Uh, and then I'll bid you adieu. Um, this first one is called uh, Phone Tree. So Phone Tree. <clears throat> All of our representatives are busy helping other customers, some of whom may have sexy voices and require more help than others. This call may be recorded for quality assurance. This call may be a cruel test of patience and endurance. Press one to speak directly with the whirlwind. Oprima el dos for Espanol. If this is an emergency, let Muzak calm your troubled soul. Press three if you were on the grassy knoll. Press four if pleasure wasn't meant to last. If you have called before, press five and we'll connect you to the past. If you are calling from a rotary phone, press six. If you are calling from the depths, press seven. Press eight to hear a dial tone and nine to hear a stranger's breath. 
Press your wrist to see if your heart's still beating. Season's greetings if it's getting to be December. Press zero or just stay on the line and we'll be with you shortly, assuming we remember. Thank you. And uh, for my final poem, I'm gonna read something um, that has to do with all the cooking that everyone seems to be doing uh, while they're in lockdown. Uh, so if you go on you know, any social media website, you, you see all these things that people are cooking, bread, this, that, the other. And I wonder if there's something deep and metaphysical about this that we are like trying to be creative and, and create sustenance for ourselves precisely when we are most thinking about mortality and all of that stuff. So I have like a light dark poem, as so many of the poems that I published in Light are, a light dark poem uh, that was published some years ago. Uh, it wasn't written specifically for the coronavirus crisis, but it's, it kind of feeds into it now. And it's called A Recipe for Night. <clears throat> a Recipe for Night. One half cup black, one half cup blue, quarter cup star stuff, coarsely ground. One old love song to whistle when the headless horseman cackles round. Eye of newt blinded, heart of man. Two tablespoons pre-sweetened bitters. A run of luck, rotten, gotten from a black cat's litter. Liqueur of hope, essence of ink. Two clots of blood from off the gurney. One dark wood sliced exactly midway in life's journey. Mix black and blue and heart of man. Beat vigorously in a bowl with clot, ink, hope, and song. Then leave out in the cold. Combine the luck and eye of newt and bitters in a blender. Now bring the heart of man indoors. Beat it again. Make sure it's tender. Vegetarians may substitute a peppercorn for eye of newt, but for the darkness at its root, only the heart of man will do. Combine ingredients in a pan. Stir uneasily and blacken over an old flame that it burns you up to know is someone else's lover. Spread evenly across horizon. Allow to cool beside the void. Garnish with stars to taste. Serve chilled in the dark wood. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Well. Melissa, if you're speaking, you're muted. Yeah, can't hear you. Thank you. Once again, I muted myself. This will probably happen every week. Get used to it. <laughs> All right. I was saying thank you for a spectacular reading, Amit. And um, thank you, Aurel and Barbara. Um, and um, our next reader is Jan Schreiber. Um, Jan was Poet Laureate of Brookline, Massachusetts from 2015 to 2017. His books include Digressions, Wily Apparitions, Bell Boys, that's B-U-O-Y-S, and Peccadillos, as well as two books of translations, A Stroke Upon the Sea and Sketch of a Serpent. A cycle of his poems, Zeno's Arrow, was set to music by Paul Allen Levi in 2001. Um, some of his criticism is collected in his book, Sparring with the Sun. He teaches in the Boley program at Brandeis University and runs the annual symposium on poetry criticism in Gunnison, Colorado. His chapbook, Bay Leaves, came out last year. You can find more at his website, janschreiber.org. Um, and Jan, please take it away. Thank you. Um, I woke up one morning a couple of years ago with a strange phrase in my mind. Uh, it was the shortcoming hotel. 
and I felt there had to be a poem connected with that. So this is the poem. He isn't going to heaven. He isn't going to hell. He's going to spend forever at the shortcoming hotel. He wasn't such a bad man, but he wasn't very good. He never beat his molly, but he cheated when he could. He preened his reputation for fine heroic acts and showered indignation on doubters of his facts. The beds are square and smallish at the shortcoming hotel, and sleepers there must get their rest while angled like an L. Room service comes each sultry dawn with unconditioned air. The menus always chicken wings, and they are always rare. The drinks are cheap and plentiful, though watered down and weak. The guests are slightly drunk, but it's oblivion they seek. So bid adieu to our dear friend, whose virtues we know well have suited him so aptly for the shortcoming hotel. He wasn't all we might, he might have been. No more are you and I. Our rooms at this, our last resort, await us when we die. Um, I too have a soap poem. This one is called Ivory or the Wife of Bath. Though we meet every day, you're never quite the same. I find it rather odd you flaunt each new facade as if this were a game some slippery tease might play. Considering every place you've touched, you are no prude. It's hard for me to see your vaunted purity, and yet I felt renewed somehow by our embrace. Your figure on the shelf once seemed a lofty bar, but now you're fading fast. Your glory days are past. I'm sad to see you are a sliver of yourself. Must I, in fact, explain? I fear, my dear, you're done. There is another, yes, quite keen to effervesce. Our days of froth and fun have dribbled down the drain. Um, this one appeared in uh, Light's Poems of the Week a while ago when there was an item in the New York Times that said, a tiny screw shows why iPhones won't be assembled in the USA. Jill wants a job. Jack wants one too, but Apple wants a little screw. Here were the flags red, white, and blue. No factories make a little screw. But search in China, in Zhengzhou, they'll fabricate a little screw. More than a billion going on two Chinese can thank a little screw for jobs that here aren't coming through for want of just a little screw. Jack and Jill find their options few. Life's bleak without a little screw. And here are just a few short ones. Um, first one has appeared in light as well, called The Politician's Wife. What rocky times she's seen him through. Public humiliation, jeers for, from those who wondered if she knew. She knew. She's seen through him for years. Um, and several years ago, uh, Dana Joya uh, observed that not many people wrote poems about business. So I wrote a business poem. It's called The Bottom Line. Reduce exposure, and in time, your sinking fortunes start to climb. Therefore, take heart. Beyond a doubt, with bottom in, you'll bottom out. And here's an old one, but I think you'll all find it still relevant. It's called Humility. I thought my first book, 
not so bad until the times engaged a lad to lacerate it on page nine. Casting my pearls before malign obtuseness was a clever trick. Every ego needs a prick. And finally, uh, this one is a, an update of Philip Larkin, who, uh, genius that he was, was also a male sexist pig and uh, wrote some uh, scurrilous poems about his uh, assistance at the library. I thought I could make them a little more subtle. So this one is called Philip Larkin Runs a Workshop. These chicks can turn an old dog to a pup. With wily smile behind a critic's frown, you try to help them prop their sonnets up while you'd prefer to pull their pantoons down. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> You're already starting. All right, so how do I turn on the video? Down in this corner. All right. Thank you, Jan. That was wonderful. Um, Right. This is going by so fast. These have been terrific readings, um, and we are at our last and um, and uh, much anticipated by many of you, reader. Um, boy, that was a terrible sentence, but you know what I mean. Um, a. E. Stallings is with us today. Um, she's an American poet who lives in Athens, Greece. Her most recent poetry collection is Like, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And her most recent verse translation is the illustrated The Battle Between the Frogs and the Mice, published by Paul Dry Books. A selected collection is forthcoming from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. And welcome, Alicia. Am I, am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Um, uh, uh, my daughter wants to say hello since it's Mother's Day. Hello. <laughs> Hello from Greece. Um, thank you, Melissa, for um, adjusting our um, the time today so to um, be a little more convenient here. It's getting to be towards 10 o'clock. Um, and thank you for arranging this. It's wonderful to actually be social for the first time in six weeks. <laughs> um, I thought I would briefly pitch for the Battle of the Frogs and the Mice um, because it is a, an epic in a nutshell, an epic in miniature, so well suited to quarantine. I won't really read much from it, but you'll see that it has some, some sweet pictures of mice and gods. So I thought there's been a lot of pressure in some uh, areas with the quarantine and so forth for people to be very productive. Um, so I thought I'd read a, a poem about feeling pressure to be productive. And this poem came about after reading um, a biography of Edna St. Vincent Millay and uh, just being overwhelmed by all that she accomplished in poetry and in a pretty wild personal life and feeling like I needed to catch up. So um, could everyone hear me? After reading the biography, Savage Beauty. I'd like to write sonnets a dozen a day, compose a libretto and maybe a play. My lustrous red hair would be crowned with the bay if I were like Edna St. Vincent Millay. I'd like to have lovers, both straight ones and gay. I'd like to hold both sexes under my sway and not give two figs about what people say, like Edna, Edna St. Vincent Millay. I'd like to throw tantrums and get my own way. I'd like to be fresh as a young Beaujolais and slyly bewitching as Morgan Le Fay, like Edna, Edna St. Vincent Millay. I'd move with the grace of one trained in ballet. My husband would not only love, but obey. People would flock to my readings and pay if I were like Edna St. Vincent Millay. 
that was a, a light poem, although not published in light. That one was in Natural Bridges. But um, I'm very grateful to light. They were um, under John Mella, very early supporter of mine. And I think brought into my mind about what was light verse, because often um, John would take poems that I thought were either slight or dark. And, um, you know, and he was very um, particular, much more particular than um, some editors from, from more uh, famous magazines. And uh, I think was um, a very good education in poetry and um, would take things very, very seriously and, and really hold you. I mean, if you turned in something that was subpar, that was not gonna pass. Um, and Melissa has carried this on. Um, uh, as well. This is a poem that Melissa accepted. Um, this, and I think um, one of the things we've been debating since uh, this very, very long year, I think, was it in February, AWP? I don't even remember now. That was, that was this year, March. Um, gosh, <laughs> yes, and there was all this debate on whether people were going to go. Um, so this seems like an appropriate poem for this year, and um, it's a parody of Houseman. Um, a poet that I love very much. And it's Terence Hearsay at the AWP. And I have a little epigraph from Houseman, the best parody I have ever seen and indeed the only good one. Now that isn't about my own poem, but that's all right. So, Terence, what's this crap you write? The metaphors are limp and trite. Rhyme is over and you scan. This stuff should be flushed down the can. Your cat is dead. That's really rough. We sympathize, but spare us Fluffy. Fluffy's dead. You don't have dental. Boo-hoo, don't get sentimental. That gothic black, the latest ink, makes you a poser, don't you think? Please stop. Don't make the muses grovel. Go write a memoir or a novel. Your retrogressive efforts pain us. Quoth Nirvana, entertain us. Entertainment. That's pathetic. What you crave is anesthetic. Hearing poems makes you crabby. Stay home, binge watch Downton Abbey, or thumb the smart screen of your phone, or text friends in the dark alone. Poetry is not for quitters. Tweet that, all you twits and twitters. I too have sworn a long hiatus only to update my status and stalked my Facebook on Facebook my old flame and spent hours Googling my name. It's true my sonnets do not drip with irony. They are not hip. When they're reviewed, they're often panned. In fact, I write them out longhand. You do not have to call them art. They're easier to learn by heart. But I would friend you since we've met in person, not the internet. I knew a hippie way back east who had a way with hops and yeast took me aside and told me, kid, I'm leaving, going off the grid. The free verse that they have here on draft is not half bad, but I like craft. I'm giving up my phone and Kindle. I'm gonna weave and buy a spindle. I plan to ponder life and death and maybe brew some crystal meth and grow some pot and read with passion poets who've gone out of fashion. And I will write and read and think and once unplugged, we'll give up drink and only quaff the crystal waters of the nine, the sacred daughters. But pass that jar of homebrew, will you? A little poison still won't kill you. And I, I thought I'd like to close on a poem that is not mine, but that I covet by Ogden Nash. And um, my daughter, who's still here, you want to say <laughs> Um, in my daughter's fourth grade class, they're talking about simile and metaphor. And so that made me think of this favorite poem of mine um, by Ogden Nash called simile and, well, about simile and metaphor called Very Like a Whale, since we've had some other Hamlet tonight. Um, so I will close my reading with this. One thing that literature would be gratefully the better for would be a more restricted employment by the authors of simile and metaphor. Authors of all races, be they Greeks, Romans, Teutons, or Celts, can't seem just to say that anything is the thing it is, but have to go out of their way to say that it is like something else. What does it mean when we are told 
that the Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold. In the first place, George Gordon Byron had enough experience to know that it probably wasn't just one Assyrian, it was a lot of Assyrians. However, as too many arguments are apt to induce apoplexy and thus hinder longevity, we'll let it pass as one Assyrian for the sake of brevity. Now then, this particular Assyrian, the one whose cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, just what does the poet mean when he says they came down like a wolf on the fold? In heaven and earth, more things, more than is dreamed of in our philosophy, there are a great many things, but I don't imagine that among them there is a wolf with purple and gold cohorts or purple and gold anything. No, no, Lord Byron, before I'll believe that this Assyrian was actually like a wolf, I must have some kind of proof. Did he run on all fours? Did he have a hairy tail and a big red mouth and big white teeth? And did he say, woof, woof? Frankly, I think it is very unlikely. And all you were entitled to say at the very most was that the Assyrian cohorts came down like a lot of Assyrian cohorts about to destroy the Hebrew host. But that wasn't fancy enough for Lord Byron. Oh dear me, no. He had to invent a lot of figures of speech and then interpolate them with the result that whenever you mention Old Testament soldiers to people, they say, oh yes, they're the ones that a lot of wolves dressed up in gold and purple ate them. That's the kind of thing that's being done all the time by poets from Homer to Tennyson. They're always comparing ladies to lilies and veal to venison. And they always say things like that the snow is a white blanket after a winter storm. Oh, is it? Is it all right then? You sleep under a six inch blanket of snow and I'll sleep under a half inch blanket of unpoetical blanket material and we'll see which one keeps warm. And after that, maybe you'll begin to comprehend dimly what I mean by too much metaphor and simile. Thank you. <laughs> My picture disappeared, Rachel. Is there any way I can get it back? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs>